Hello everybody, it's Kara from Wild Book Garden, and today I'm here with part one of my September wrap-up. No, October. <laughs> We're off to a great start. It was a very um, varied reading month. I had several new favorites of the year. Um, I had some disappointments pretty much all across the map as far as like ratings and feelings go, so let's get started. Um, the first book I finished was Love and Lavender by Josie S. Kilpack. I received this copy in exchange for an honest review, so thank you so much to the publisher. Um, and this is the fourth book in the, it's like, yeah, Mayfield family romance series, but I don't think they're connected very much at all. I was able to read this one out of order, um, but I think the, the earlier books do follow different characters that you kind of get glimpses of in this book. Um, but this is a marriage of convenience story which is a trope I love. Um, we're following two main characters, Hazel who is a young woman who um, she was born with a club foot and because of the time period, let me check what year this was, I think it's in the Regency era, um, so she's treated very badly because of this. She's considered basically unmarriageable um, which is fine with her. She actually doesn't care that much about getting married. Um, she teaches mathematics I think at, it is at a girl's school and she really loves doing that. Um, and then our other main character, our male lead, is named Duncan um, and he has autism. It's not labeled like that in the book because that wasn't a diagnosis then, um, but the like publishing material does um, confirm that he is autistic, which I appreciate that we have that like listed specifically. And he also has no interest in getting married until his kind of adopted like uncle or something. Like him and Hazel have no blood relation to each other, but his guardian is a member of her family. And for reasons, um, he kind of gives them an ultimatum. He doesn't intend it to be, but that's kind of what it ends up being, um, that the two of them each have to get married in order to secure their inheritance from him. And Duncan is having some problems at work, um, so he would like to be able to just buy out his building and continue doing his job, so he wants his inheritance. Hazel really wants to be able to support her own girls' school, um, where they can teach advanced subjects. So they both have the reasons for wanting to secure their inheritance. Um, um, and they decide that since neither of them wants to get married, they'll just like marry each other um, and divorce basically immediately. But there's a catch. Hazel's uncle kind of considers this cheating, so he says you have to live together um, in the same house for a year and then you can get your inheritance. So that's what kind of sets up the romance premise for this book and I really loved a lot of things about this. Um, I really enjoyed the writing style and I thought the setting was done really well. I really loved Hazel and Duncan as main characters. We see how Hazel's disability and Duncan's neurodivergence has um, shaped part of the way they view the world because of the way people treat them, but they also have like other personality traits outside of that, so I think that was balanced well. Um, I'm not an Unvoices reviewer, but it seemed that that was done very thoughtfully. I also liked the story. Um, we actually don't get to the marriage of convenience part until like further on in the book than I maybe would have thought, but I didn't even mind um, because I was really enjoying getting to know these characters and like seeing them interact. Um, they actually, Duncan and Hazel kind of form a friendship via letters um, before the they ever like hatched this scheme between them so it was really cool getting to see them get to know each other and see how they play off of each other so well um, like they solve like math puzzles together and it's just really fun to see that and I also really enjoyed the romance in this book between Hazel and Duncan and um, seeing them spend more time together and like again a marriage of convenience is a trope I just love and I really like the way it was done here I did however have a few things kind of near the end of the book or most of them were near the end that did bring this down for me a little bit one is so I love the Duncan loves cats. Um, there's this weird like throwaway, basically like he realized that um, three cats was too many to take care of, so he just like let two of them go, um, which I just thought was weird and out of character. Like I assume the cats are fine, but it was just, that was kind of strange. I didn't like that. And again, it seems out of character for Duncan as a person. Um, I also didn't really like the way the conflict was done near the end. Um, there were a couple of things actually about the conflict that felt kind of forced for story reasons. And then one specific thing about the conflict that I didn't like, um, I don't think this is really a spoiler, but if you want to skip the end, you can. Um, one thing I really didn't like is that part of the ending conflict seemed to be like suddenly this question of like, wait, can Duncan even experience love? Um, which is a really, really harmful trope and assumption about autistic people and there was no indication of that for the rest of the book and it just felt out of left field. I didn't, I really didn't like that and I wish um, we could have done something different. Like there were definitely ways to like create conflict that would not have involved that so I didn't like that. Oh I forgot to mention one of the other things about the ending um, that I didn't care for was something about the epilogue but that is like purely a personal preference. It's not like a failing of the book, it's just something that I personally don't enjoy. Altogether though I did really enjoy pretty much everything else about this book and I gave Love and Lavender 4.5 stars. I do want to note that um, differently from all of the other books I've read so far in this proper romance line, um, this one does have some slightly more religious elements. It's definitely not like a huge part of the book at all, um, like it doesn't take 
over the story and it's not like a focus of this book by any means. So just keep that in mind if that is something you want to be aware of. Next I finished The Plentiful Darkness by Heather Kastner. Um, this is the third Heather Kastner book I have read. They're not connected in any way. Um, and this is her most recent release. We follow our main character Rooney um, and she is, I think she's an orphan and she's surviving on her own um, by collecting moonlight. She has a lunar mirror that she can use to collect moonlight which she sells um, and she's on the streets. She doesn't have anyone to take care of her and there's this group of boys called the Rough House Boys who um, they're kind of one of the gangs or groups that are competing for this territory because um, there's a lot of kids on the streets who are basically doing what Rooney is doing and it's a really really hard life um, and then one day Trick who's kind of the leader of the Rough House Boys who is sort of Rooney's nemesis um, he steals her lunar mirror and Rooney really needs this she depends on it so she goes after him to try and get it back um, but he actually ends up getting kind of taken or like he disappears um, and the reason he disappears is because of this like darkness basically that has been stealing children um, for a while now. So he becomes one of the children who gets stolen and Rooney really needs her mirror so she goes after him um, into this world called the Plentiful Darkness. So they get there and they're trying to figure out why these kids have ended up here, why they've been taken, if there's any way that they can like go back. They end up coming across a couple of other kids that they sort of join forces with and sadly this is my least favorite book by Heather Kastner so far. Um, it's not bad, it's just I didn't enjoy it nearly as much as the other two I've read from her. I did really like Rooney as a main character. I just really admire her strength and that even though she's been through so much, she's still a very compassionate person. Like she still, like she doesn't hesitate when it comes to saving people or doing the right thing. Um, and I really admired that. And I also thought Trick was a really interesting character. Um, we're gonna get into, like I kind of wish we had gotten a lot more time of the friendship, like the developing friendship between him and Rooney because I was really interested in that dynamic because um, they obviously start out enemies but they end up having to work together and they're in very similar positions so like it would have been really cool to see them like become friends um and that sort of happened but not really and then as always I just I do like the way that Heather Kastner writes I think she's good at creating atmosphere um and I do think the ending was really like I think the emotional payoff of the ending was really good but otherwise I was pretty disappointed in this one um like I said I wasn't a big fan of the characterization I liked Rooney I liked the idea of seeing her and Trick become friends but we get a couple of other side characters who I just I don't know I didn't dislike them like there's one friend in particular um that they make where I don't dislike her but I just don't feel like she was super well developed and normally I feel like Heather Kastner like one of the things she's really good at is getting you to buy into these friend groups very early um like I have with the other two books I've read from her and that didn't really happen here I kind of was just like why are you here? <laughs> like I did end up buying into this friend group by the end of the book but normally that happens much earlier so that was kind of a bummer um and then the other big thing that I didn't like is the setting like this setting of the plentiful darkness is frankly incredibly boring <laughs> um and it's by design like the whole point of the plentiful darkness is that it's like monochromatic and um like very like dull and very oppressive and like I get that but it was very boring to read about that for like chapters on end. Um, it was, this was still a quick read, like it didn't like drag for me or anything, but um, yeah, I'm still excited to read more from Heather Kastner, but this just wasn't my favorite from her. And I gave The Plentiful Darkness 3.5 stars. Next, I finished a book that I actually have a very short like reasons to read video for, so I will link that down below. Um, and that is Garlic and the Vampire by Brie Paulson. This is a graphic novel and it is one of the most precious things I have ever seen in my life. <laughs> like I loved this. Um, so we are following our main character character Garlic who is a little garlic girl and the story does explain why some of the vegetables are people and why some of them aren't which I appreciate um, but yeah so we're following Garlic and she lives in this little village um, and all she really wants to do is like stay home and take care of her garden and like keep to herself because she has anxiety um, she's just oh, she's so precious and then one day a vampire moves into town and all of the village people are really scared and they're like well Garlic you should go like you're Garlic you can go take care of this and Garlic really doesn't want to go um, but it, finally she agrees to and then when she gets to the castle she ends up finding out that maybe this vampire isn't so bad after all and it's a story about friendship and bravery and I just absolutely loved it <laughs> um, this was this was so cute so the art style is lovely um, the messages are heartwarming the characters are just precious and I love them um, yeah like just the cozy vibes like I just loved everything about this if you need like a little mood pick me up I would highly recommend this graphic novel um, and also like I don't read very many graphic novels they're 
they tend to be very hard for me to like follow that method of storytelling but this one I was able to follow really well so I feel like that's another point in this graphic novel's favor um but yeah I gave Garlic and the Vampire five stars I loved it. Next I finished Half a Soul by Olivia Atwater this is the first book in the Regency Fairy Tales series um which is a series of companion novels although I've read the first two and I would definitely recommend reading them in order just because you get cameos from characters who you see later and I think I, I just think it's fun to read them in order um but yeah so spoiler alert but this book and the next book are two more <laughs> favorites of the year um which is so funny because I had picked up this book at least three or four times and read the first page and the writing was great but it just like wasn't clicking with my mood um and then one night I picked it up and I blew through it all in one night and then I did the exact same thing with the next book the next night so <laughs> obviously I loved this. So in this book we follow our main character Theodora Eddings but she goes by Dora um and when she was a young girl she had half of her soul ripped away from her um because in this in this Regency world it's like it's Regency England plus magic basically and that includes fairies um and the fairies are overall definitely more of that like sinister fair folk kind of thing um and that yeah that's obvious based on what happened to Dora which is that a fairy um was actually trying to take her entire soul from her but um he was interrupted and so she only had half of her soul taken from her but as a result um Dora has no sense of fear embarrassment or even happiness um a condition which makes her sadly prone to accidental scandal so Dora is going with her I think it's her cousin her cousin is named Vanessa so they're going to London for the season to try and find Vanessa a suitable match um but Vanessa has another motive so her and Dora are really close Vanessa is actually the one who saved Dora from having her entire soul taken um and Vanessa has decided that the one one person who might be able to help Dora um, is the Lord Sorcier of England who is this man named Lord Elias Wilder um, and he's in London so Vanessa thinks that if they can go there and convince him um, to help then he might be able to help like restore Dora's the rest of Dora's soul to her or like figure something out and Dora eventually does end up meeting Elias and um, it does not <laughs> does not go well at first and actually I really was not a fan of Elias like the first couple times the first one or two times that we meet him he made a very bad first impression on me um, um, but he grew on me so so much like I really really loved him by the end of this book um, and I think part of it is because like because Dora does not feel like it says like she doesn't feel embarrassment <laughs> um, or fear or anything so that when Elias was being a jerk to her she just like gave it right back like it didn't hurt her <laughs> and she just kind of like sassed him right back um, which made it feel very equal and also you find out later that Elias actually does have specific reasons for why he is acting the way he is. I still think he could have like been nicer to her when he first met but it, like you understand why he does it and it's not just like generic tragic backstory where I don't have to be nice to anyone kind of thing. Um, so anyway I loved this. I really really loved our main character Dora. Um, I have a real like soft spot in my heart for characters who everyone assumes can't feel things um, but they actually do feel things. They just feel things differently and very deeply um, and I'm so impressed at the way that Olivia Atwater could write Dora so that we see how she has been changed by what happened to her. Like it hurts to see her not be fully herself, you know, to not be able to completely experience joy and um, and other emotions like that. Like she can still feel some things but there are certain emotions that are very muffled for her and I'm so impressed with the way that Olivia Atwater could make that fit with the story while also showing the reader that like Dora does have feelings, like she does feel things very deeply, she does care about people um, and it's really heartbreaking to see the way that some people, like especially her aunt, um, Vanessa's mother, treat her like she's not even a person um but yeah like that balance I think was really well done with Dora I like I said I really ended up loving Elias surprisingly because I was not a fan of his at first um and their in interactions together are so wonderful and like we see how well matched they are for each other like they really are equals and it's just so satisfying and so wonderful to like see them together um and we also see the two of them end up working together to um really like try and change things for the better in their community because um, one of the themes of this book that I really really loved is like the necessity and the power of justified anger. Like one of the reasons that Elias is so angry and rude to society people all the time is because like he has been in the war, I think this is like Napoleonic war I think, um, and so he's he's seen so much horrible things he comes back with PTSD and he just like he sees people not caring and he also sees people not caring about like the people who are like starving or who are in workhouses and it's like it he he hates that he has to go to these society parties and pretend to like make small talk when he knows that like people are dying because there's this like sleeping sickness that is going around too and so we just we see him and Dora like 
really like work together to try and make the world a better place. I also just really love like that that whole idea um, of like using anger as fuel to make change. Like I just really really enjoyed that here. Um, I also loved the writing. Like it's it's got this very clever. Um, kind of like witty sense of humor that I really enjoyed but it doesn't go over the top. Um, I think the character work was fantastic. Like I said I've just I really loved like the themes and everything. Like I just basically loved everything about this and it does have very good reviews on Goodreads but I remember when I looked at reviews there were quite a few people who were like oh that was like really sweet and fun what a nice way to like pass my reading time and it's just interesting because like I finished this and I was like obsessed with it. <laughs> and it's just kind of funny because like it, some of it is very like sweet and cozy um but some of it isn't like I just I just really really loved this book and not in like a casual way <laughs> um yeah and something else I was really impressed with or that I really enjoyed was like the magic and the setting and the way those work together like I one of my I think one of my pet peeves at this point is in historical fiction or historical fantasy when it's set in a very specific time period but it doesn't feel like it is or it doesn't it doesn't feel like it needs to be. Like obviously there's magic, I'm totally fine with you changing things, but if you change so much that the book could be set at any time in any place, I kind of am like well what's the point of putting it in a historical setting? And one thing I really loved about this book is that the setting felt very real, like we see how it affects the way that these characters have to interact with each other, like all of these rules of society and things like that, but we also see the way that magic has kind of softened or changed those rules and I just thought that was really brilliant as well. So obviously I loved this. Um, I gave Half a Soul five stars. Then as I said, um, the very next night I read 10,000 Stitches by Olivia Atwater. Um, this is the second companion book in that series and um, I love this one too. I don't, I, I love both of them for different reasons so I don't know like which of the two is my favorite um, but so we are following a different main character um, and her name is Euphemia Reeves but she goes by Effie um, and she is a servant. She's a maid in this like wealthy household um, and she ends up kind of getting a crush on the like young man of the house um, and she knows this is a bad idea and it's dangerous and she's like not, she's trying not to like encourage it or do anything about it. Um, but she ends up getting a very well-meaning but sometimes disastrous fairy godfather, kind of, um, who we actually get a glimpse of in the first book. His name is Lord Blackthorn and he is one of the fair folk, so he is a literal fairy godfather. And he, <laughs> he's such an interesting character because like he's kind of terrifying sometimes but it's not his fault. Like he just like does not understand some things about humanity so Effie is like desperately trying to like teach him things because he just like he keeps doing his best and screwing everything up. <laughs> um, yeah so anyway he shows up and tells Effie that like he's going to make her dream come true and help her like um, like marry the, the son of this household and you know they're gonna be happy together. Um, and the deal is that it's going to be measured in how much Effie can sew because she also sews. Um, so Effie has the length of time of 10,000 stitches to get this man to fall in love with her. And if she doesn't um, she has to get like whisked away to fairyland. Um, like that's kind of the the agreement that they have. Um, yeah, I love this one too. Um, once again, I love our main characters. I just, I love Effie so much and she's so like plucky and smart and kind. Um, I just really really admire her. I really love the friendship that she has with one of the other servants named Lydia. And like I said, I really enjoyed Lord Blackthorn as a character. He is just so interesting and yeah, like I just love them. I love him and Effie's interactions. Um, I really like the story. I found that really really interesting. Like we see Effie have to, um, it, it's kind of, this is very like, you see from Olivia Atwater's um, author's note, this is a very very loose kind of interpretation of a Cinderella retelling. Um, and so we see Effie have to kind of dress up and like go through all of this to um, try and like put herself on the same level as this man. Um, and I just found the story really interesting. This book also has one of my favorite romance tropes in it, which I loved. I thought it was done really well. Um, I definitely like both of these books. I think the romance is not like, I don't know. I don't know if I would say it's not the main focus because it is an important part of the books, but there's a lot of other things happening too. Um, and this book, like the first book, I really really loved the themes and the ideas and the messages here. Um, this one also has like that emphasis on the fact that anger is not only okay but it is necessary and it is powerful. Um, 
like especially anger that comes from there being wrong in the world and unhappiness in the world and like doing something about it um so i i really loved that i really liked the way sewing was used here i think that as a quasi cinderella retelling this is really really interesting but it also absolutely stands on its own um so yeah i loved this this is definitely one of my favorite ongoing series um the third book i think has just come out recently so i'm very excited to read that um and i gave it 10,000 stitches five stars next i finished a properly unhaunted place by william alexander um this is a very short middle grade novel and we are following our main character Rosa Diaz um, and her and her mother are appeasement specialists um, so this is kind of an alternate world where it's like a contemporary spooky fantasy um, a little bit spooky where in this world um, every place basically in the country in the world this book is set in the US so I don't know if it's like worldwide or just the US um, but there are ghosts everywhere basically and Rosa and her mother's job um, are to like appease them and to um like kind of take care of them not cause havoc on earth and then they end up moving to this town called Ingot which is the only town in the entire country that does not have ghosts um and so Rosa is she hates it <laughs> like she gets there and she's like why are we here what are we supposed to do everything feels so creepy and empty without the ghosts like what's going on um and she ends up making friends with this boy named Jasper and then creepy things start happening in the town where maybe Ingot is not so unhaunted after all um or maybe it's not going to stay that way and so the two of them have to work together and figure out what is going on and what they need to do um to protect like all of the people in the town and to figure out why there aren't ghosts here um yeah i really really enjoyed this i really loved rosa and jasper's friendship um i thought the setting was really interesting i also really loved the writing style um it's just it's very like funny and interesting and clever and like there's like some whimsical descriptions and everything but it's also very grounded um i don't know how to describe it but i was just really impressed with the writing um i also forgot to mention it is illustrated by kelly murphy so there's some like really cool illustrations throughout too and yeah i just really enjoyed this one um i liked the story a lot there were a couple of little story things that i found a little frustrating or i maybe would have liked um to be done differently but overall i really enjoyed this i gave a properly unhaunted place four stars and i'm really excited to read more from this author I think there's actually a sequel to this book and I definitely want to check that out as well as some of his other books. Next I finished a short story collection and that is Meriton Vignettes Tales of Pride and Prejudice by Elizabeth Adams. Um, this is a very very short um, anthology or not anthology short story collection um, by Elizabeth Adams that as you can tell are different Pride and Prejudice retellings and they're very short. I have read a full-length novel well it was, it was a short novel but it was a novel by this author um, that I really enjoyed and I have a couple other books by her that I'm excited to get to. This one I didn't quite get what I wanted from it. I think these short stories would have worked a lot better if they were longer because um, some of them were really interesting ideas like there's a story about Caroline Bingley finding love which I read a retelling that kind of focused on that that I really enjoyed so that was something I was into and I liked it but I just think it would have been so much better if it had gotten more time and we had gotten more development um yeah so like I don't really have too much to say about this one um if I average my ratings out it went out to about 3.75 stars um there were some stories that I enjoyed like I said I liked the Caroline Bingley one even though I wanted more from it he had it coming was a story at the very end that I think was one of the longer ones and I thought that one was well done yeah like I some of the ideas here were interesting and I just wish we had gotten more time to develop those um but I do still want to read more from this author and um, I definitely think if you look at the des description for this and some of the concepts interest you you might enjoy them um and yeah like I said 3.75 stars next I finished Beast A Tale of Love and Revenge by Lisa Jensen this is a Beauty and the Beast retelling um that has very very low Goodreads reviews and um I can kind of understand why which we'll get into um but this is a again it's a retelling and um it's a very it's a very different setup for the retelling than we often get um our main character is this young girl named Lucy um who is a maid at the Chevalier um Chevalier Beaumont mansion or estate um and he is a really really despicable person um and kind of the inciting incident for the story is that he rapes Lucy and Lucy gets the opportunity to take revenge on him um and so she is the one who kind of like initiates the curse that turns him into a beast um and she gets turned into like a, a candlestick basically um because she wants to be able to observe him and to see him suffer um because of the horrible things that he did to her and yeah so this one it starts out 
very dark like right from the beginning and we see lucy kind of uh, like watching um the chevalier the beast be really angry at his fate and um, there is the loophole of if somebody is able to fall in love with him then he can be changed back But Lucy doesn't think this is ever gonna happen because he's such a horrible person um, and now his outside reflects his inside um, But then the longer they spend together um, Lucy starts thinking that maybe he's not actually the same person like he seems to be acting a lot different um, He seems to be becoming much more kinder like they actually end up interacting and talking and it doesn't seem like the Beast Is the same person who did this horrible thing to her um, and then the Bell character shows up and that kind of complicates things even further because now Lucy doesn't really know what she wants to happen and um, yeah, I I did not like this very much um, and I knew going in that some people were really unhappy with the way certain things were handled but I had heard, I, this, is, this is gonna be a book I basically have to spoil for you guys to like actually talk about the issues I had with it um, so the whole rest of this thing probably is gonna contain spoilers just so you know. So based on what I had heard from other reviewers I knew that there was some kind of weird magic thing going on where I had thought what that meant is that we're gonna find out that the beast like uh, the Chevalier who rapes Lucy and then the beast character who she ends up developing some kind of attachment for are actually like literally separate people um, like they're not the same person and that's not really what happens and this is not like by the way I was not like misled by reviews or anything I just I think misunderstood um, because that's not really what happens here and I'm gonna try and explain it to the best of my ability but honestly the reveal was very confusing in places so I think I have it right but we'll see um so we find out that the beast like is the chevalier but not exactly because he was apparently born looking like the beast like that is his true form um because of some things that happened that I don't even remember and his mother is like horrified and she eventually ends up getting a spell cast on him so that he looks really handsome and like human and all of that and that's like basically that's like the chevalier character and we're kind of left to understand um that because the of the way that like now he always got his way and like everyone fawned over him because he was really handsome and i think also maybe because of something about the way the spell worked like it went wrong somehow i don't know but basically he ends up becoming this despicable person who later sexually assaults Lucy um and I like that's that's like what we find out and then there's like a bunch of other like confusing magic stuff that happens but my issue is with the earlier part so like wh where is the responsibility because since I'm already spoiling things um the Beast and Lucy end up happily ever after but it's like okay but he is the same person like the Chevalier and the Beast are the same person so the beast did do this to Lucy like yes he didn't look like himself and it's implied that that maybe he was like partly corrupted by the magic but I remember like even though I'm obviously fuzzy on the details because it was explained very confusingly I am very clear on the fact that like no this was actually him like it's not like the beast was like under a spell to look beautiful but behave horribly it there was still choice involved so it just like where is the responsibility there like it was so weird it's like this is like you can't explain this by being like oh he wasn't really himself like he didn't look like himself but he was the one making this decision and it's just like why like why would the author do that like i think she talks in the author's note about like wanting to explore like what makes a monster and you know the ability to to like redeem yourself and like i get that but the way she did it i think is counter to the message like i assume that she's not trying to ex like you know write a rapist apology story um like i don't think that's what she was trying to do but it kind of comes out feeling that way a little bit um buried under all the weird confusing magic stuff it's like so wait this is the same person but like wh where's the the responsibility there like <laughs> i don't know i'm not doing a very good job of explaining this because it was very confusing and it made me very angry um also this is like a much more minor thing compared to the other issue I had um but while we're already spoiling things I hate this trope in Beauty and the Beast retellings um I hate when we end the story and part of the happily ever after is that the beast stays a beast I understand what they're trying to do but it's weird for me Like thematically, I love it. Like I love the, like realizing the outer beauty does not reflect who you are inside and all of that. Like I love that, but there are ways to do that 
without like making one of your romantic leads like literally an animal like i don't i i'm not into that i don't like reading that um like he looks like a freaking bison <laughs> like i just i know that's not necessarily a super popular opinion um and actually like the author talks about how disappointing it is and like the disney movie when like he turns back into a human and it's like i i don't know i guess i'm the weird one because i never felt like that like when i would see the movie um like i remember definitely being like oh there has to you have to adjust because you're used to seeing this character look a certain way but i'm never like oh no like bring back the animal man like I just anyway i didn't like this i gave beast 2.5 stars um i i realized i didn't talk about the couple of things i did actually like but very briefly um i found lucy a compelling character um i think the writing of this book itself was good but i just had a lot of issues with the way that sexual assault was handled like the lack of accountability and like maybe like like i said it was extremely confusing when we finally got things revealed so it is possible that i am like misunderstanding or misinterpreting something that would have fixed some of that but i don't think so and judging by other reviewers um i i think it's not super likely that that's what happened um so yeah i sadly was not a fan of this one i see why it is well known for being not a very good beauty in the beast retelling um but i am glad i glad i finally read it now and i like no um but yeah 2.5 stars next i finished court of lions by sumaya daoud this is the second and final book in the mirage duology um and this is a sci fantasy blend that is inspired by um a, a moroccan setting i believe and in the first book we're following our main character amani um who she finds out that she is almost a perfect body double for the princess Madame, and so Amani gets kidnapped and brought to the palace um, because there have been uh, attempts on Madame's life and so she feels very uncomfortable going into these public functions and she's like well now Amani can do it um, because there's a lot of like political turmoil and um, distrust because um, this planet is is basically like post-violent colonization and Madame is the daughter of the colonizer and one of the colonized peoples. There's a lot of like different layers to why um, why there is so much unrest here that I'm not going to try and like explain all of it at once um, but it is it is very well explained in the series it's very well done and I really enjoyed the second book. Um, I can't really say too much about where this one picks up but obviously after the events of the first book um, and that we also see a lot more about this brewing rebellion that is happening on this planet and what um, Amani and possibly even Madam's place in that will be and I really really enjoyed the second book. Um, I remember when it was released, was it last year? A lot of people were disappointed in this one and I think like that's one of the reasons I put it off for so long because I really enjoyed book one and I was like oh no it's a disappointing conclusion but I really liked it. Um, like I really I really thought this was very well done. Um, I love the writing style. I think it's like a little bit lyrical um, and you really get a feel for the setting and the atmosphere um, but you also there's also like really great character work and like theme work and everything um, I really loved like we actually get um, some chapters from Madam's perspective here or like following her specifically um, and she's such an interesting character I love the way she was written um, I love the way that Daoud doesn't like completely excuse her previous behavior but she gives you context um and we see madame really grow and i really enjoyed amani as well and i loved i loved their like kind of found sister relationship like it's definitely a rocky one um for for a while but i i really loved seeing them like find that in each other um i love what this series does thematically the second book especially is a lot about um choosing to do the more dangerous thing because you know that like you know you're going to be in danger at some point anyway so you might as well do the biggest best thing that you can like it actually reminded me of a quote from spinning silver by naomi novik which is one of my favorite books it was on a bookmark it was perfect timing because i saw it right after reading this book and it was something like um but it was the same choice all the time the choice between one death and all the little ones or something like that um and so we see amani like trying to make other characters understand why she's doing this why she's putting herself in danger for something that might not work out as far as things that didn't work for me as much um i didn't find either of the romances very compelling um I, and I, even in book one like amani's romantic relationship 
I didn't really feel super invested in. And then here we also see Madam have one and I really like that it was a female-female relationship and that's not treated as a big deal at all um, in this setting. Um, and I really, it's interesting because I really loved seeing Madam find love and like find this specific kind of happiness that she thought she would never get. So like I liked that but like the character herself I don't think was super well developed. Um, but that was like a pretty minor complaint and then the only other thing is that while I did still think this book was as well told as book one if not better I think it wasn't maybe quite as compelling possibly because we have like pretty much one focus for this book as opposed to I think we had more subplots going in the first novel um but I still thought this was really well done and I think this is a really underhyped duology and I gave Court of Lions four stars Next, I finished The Dark Days Deceit by Alison Goodman. This is the third and final book in the Lady Helen series or the Dark Days Club series. And don't be fooled, this book is like 500 pages. It doesn't look like it, but it is. Um, and this is the like epic conclusion to that series. And um, we're following Lady Helen, of course, as our main character who finds out in the first book um, that she has these like magical abilities um, that make her a reclaimer, which are these this group of people who have magic, um, or not magic, I guess, who have these I don't think they call it magic. They have these like abilities um, that helps them fight deceivers who are these creatures in the world who um, look like humans but they like feed off of human energy and the reclaimers are the only ones who can fight them. Um, and so at this point in the series we're finding out more about this really big threat that the reclaimers are facing and what Lady Helen's part in it is and what Lord Carlson's part in it is. He's kind of the person who brought her into this world and started training her and everything and we're, we're finding out more, we're seeing more about like the two of them working together to fight this really huge threat um, and that's probably all I can say without spoiling things um, but this was like such an epic conclusion this was so good um, even though it's a long book it didn't feel long because like I was so into it the whole time I feel like I should say the last like few wraps were just like brought to you by Hannah from Lynn Hermione who has excellent taste and if you don't follow her you should um, but yeah I was just I've been reading a lot of like series that she got me into um lately i was like spamming her with my stressed messages but this was so good i was so invested i was like so into this book that my chest actually hurt <laughs> like that's how like intense things were i like it was a lot but in the best possible way um i think this was a really really satisfying conclusion um i, I continued to really love these characters like lady helen and lord carlston and um a lot of the supporting characters as well um and i think allison goodman does a really amazing job of balancing like plot and character stuff and like specifically the like climaxes or like um like battle scenes i get i tend to find those very boring i think she perfectly balances the like action sequences with the like revelations about what's going on um because every like all three books in this series there's like a really just incredibly um explosive finale at the end of the book and i think she does those really really well i really love the character dynamics here um there are some reasons why lady helen and lord carlston's um bond is very complicated um but i i just really thought that was done very well like their relationship is just so engrossing and so well written this is another historical fantasy series where i feel like the setting is really well done in that like it doesn't um it doesn't overload you with like historical information but it's definitely very grounded in that time period um and we also we see how the time period affects the things that the characters can do but it also, we see like that magic kind of changes things a little bit too. I also really love the writing style itself. Um, yeah, like as I've been saying this, I think this was just a really, really satisfying conclusion. I did give this book 4.5 stars because there were a couple of things that like, I don't know, I would have, I, I think could have been done more effectively or differently or better, I don't know. But I really, really loved this and I think this is a series, like you'll you'll see when I do my series book tag at the end of the year, but this is like the epitome of a series that is more than the sum of its parts for me because um, I gave the first and third book 4.5 stars and the second book 4 stars. So none of them got 5 stars from me, but as a whole, this trilogy is 5 stars. It is one of the best constructed trilogies I think I've read. Um, it just absolutely fantastic um and also i'm gonna say something completely out of context so if you haven't read this series you probably don't know what this means but if you have i bet you do um i knew it next i finished the last namsara by kristen chicarelli and this is a buddy read with roya from unicorn hunter books um who i will link down below as with everybody i talk about and this is the first in i think a companion trilogy um 
sadly neither of us enjoy this book very much um so we're following our main character asha she was like initially um like corrupted by these dragons the dragons are seen as very bad in this world um and she was corrupted by them and she like led to a lot of people dying because some dragons attacked um and they also burned asha's face and she has a lot of like um insecurity about that and now at this point um asha has dedicated herself to like killing the rest of the dragons in this world but we see that she is still kind of drawn to these old stories which are linked to the dragons and so she's worried that she's being like corrupted again and of course asha ends up finding out more and realizing that maybe um like maybe the dragons aren't so bad or maybe so maybe things are different than she thought she's also really desperate though because she has to kill the king of the dragons in order to get out of this really horrible marriage that she doesn't like this arranged marriage um that she doesn't want to go through with and then there are some other things that happen she ends up being assisted by this um this character named Torwin who is a slave in her fiance's house because there's also slavery in this world um and yeah I this was just like a really mediocre book for me sadly I did like some of the dragon characters and I did like Torwin more than most of the other characters like I don't feel like he was incredibly well developed but he was at least like likable um I did not care for Asha very much um she was very frustrating she was very inconsistent too because like she would go in the same scene almost like she would go from really buying into this whole um like slavery enforced caste system um of being like like oh how can the slave even like look at her blah 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 and then like the next moment she would be like oh you're right i should use your name when i'm speaking to you and it, it just felt like it didn't feel like character development it didn't feel like her struggling it just felt like bad writing um and that was another thing is like the way that torwin's character was handled and like the slavery in general was dealt with was just very very uncomfortable like asha refers to him like when she's speaking to him she calls him slave for most of the book and it was like i just didn't really i don't know i didn't really buy into their interactions together because it's like that's a pretty big thing that we need to like deal with and i don't feel like it was dealt with very well um like the power imbalance was just weird and i also just think there was too much going on in this book like it was boring but there was also too much going on um because like there was like the dragon things there was like this old story thing like these old stories like corrupt people and they like give you this illness if you tell them um but that was also like connected to the dragons and then there's all these like different political factions and then there's also um like we actually get like snippets from these old stories and trying to figure out how those fit into like this idea of the last namsara and all of that and i think if the like if i had been enjoying the book more if i felt like the book was better written it probably wouldn't have felt like too much was going on but because so many aspects of this felt kind of half-baked it felt like it felt very jumbled like it felt like a lot um and like normally i love stories that deal with the importance of storytelling but here it just didn't do anything for me yeah and i also feel like the romance was kind of not explained very well like one of the characters involved it's like why do you like this person they've never been anything but horrible to you um yeah anyway i was really disappointed in this it wasn't like a really terrible book but i didn't really enjoy it either um and i gave the last namsara three stars and finally the last book i'm going to talk about in this part of the wrap-up is gustavo the shy ghost by flavia z drago um this was so so precious so it's about this ghost named gustavo um who is very shy and because he's very shy he feels um very like lonely he doesn't really have any friends because he doesn't feel like he's good at like making them and it's about him deciding that he wants to make some friends and what happens after that um yeah it's so short that i don't want to like explain more but i adored the art style i just think it is so cute um and so like aesthetically pleasing um i love the story and the messages i just really really love this this is definitely going to be in my i think favorite picture books for the year um and i give gustavo the shy ghost five stars okay everybody so those were all of the books i read in the first part of october <laughs> i got it right that time um please comment down below and let me know if you have read any of these books what you thought of them or if you're going to pick them up and um let me know if you have ever been so invested in a book that your chest hurt or something <laughs> I feel like that's probably not normal um and yeah just let me know if there's been a book that like you were so into it you had like some kind of physical reaction to it because um I'd love to know I'm not alone <laughs> thank you guys so much for watching I will see you soon with another video and I hope you love the next book you read bye